Happy Mother's Day to everyone listening to this message today, or watching the message today. Um, my message this morning is about Mother's Day. It's based on the book of Ruth. Actually, it's based on the entire book of Ruth, all four chapters. And the title of my message is Looking in the Mirror. Now, I chose this passage in Scripture because Naomi reflects our journey from being God's children. From abandoning their identity and then returning to him as his servants. We return to God's blessings when we embrace our identity as servants of God. The Old Testament book of Ruth recounts the heartwarming story of Ruth the Moabite and it leaves everything behind, she leaves everything behind to follow her mother-in-law Naomi to the Holy Land, ultimately fully embracing Judaism and becoming a great-grandmother to King David. A man was walking around at a county fair when he met a couple that he knew. In between them was their little daughter, five years old. He had a conversation with the husband and wife for a while, and then he hunkered down and looked the little girl eyeball to eyeball. Well, he had to push away this huge mound of cotton candy she was carrying. He said to her, you can't eat all of that. That's twice as big as you are. And she said, oh, yes, I can. I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> Now that is a pretty good description of the book of Ruth. It is much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. So I'm gonna summarize the story. It was about 1100 BC. In the hill country of Judea, times were tough. The famine is in the land, bread is hard to find. Elimelech and Naomi ask each other, what are we going to do? Elimelech says, I hear things are better across the lake. So they go across the lake to Moab, where they settle down for a while. Their two sons are with them. They get involved in the community, marry some local women, and the family has grown. Now, there are three sets of husbands and wives, Elimelech and Naomi, Malon and Ruth, and Kilian and Orpah. Life is good, and then it isn't. Elimelech dies, we don't know why. The two boys, Malon and Kilian, die. And Naomi no longer has two sons and a husband. Naomi is left destitute in a land that is not her own. She decides to go back to Bethlehem. She hopes that some of the older folks will remember her there. Maybe she can beg on the streets. She starts out and her daughters-in-law decide to go with her. She says to them, you must be kidding. You're smarter than that, aren't you? Orpah says, you're right. She turns around and goes back to her family home. Ruth says, I will stay with you. Naomi says, no, you do not want to do that. Even if I get married again, even if I could possibly have babies, it would never work for you and any sons I might produce. Ruth thinks about it and says, that's okay. I will stay with you. They go on together, climbing the hills to Bethlehem. When they arrive, the women surround Naomi. She, she says, call me Mara, which means bitter. Times have been tough for me. They settle in and Ruth starts going to the barley field. The harvesters have come through. Ruth goes with the rest of the gleaners and gathers a few kernels. Now gleaning is where you get to pick up the scraps that are left over after the harvest has been happened. They have a barley loaf whenever they can from those gleaned kernels, gleaned kernels. But Boaz catches the eye of Ruth and Ruth catches the eye of Boaz and suddenly there is a spark between them. As they glean the harvested fields, Ruth is collecting more than the others. Naomi notices this and says to Ruth, this could be interesting. Naomi manipulates a scenario in which Ruth will tempt Boaz, and Boaz might want to respond. Her plan works. Ruth tells Naomi that she worked with a man named Boaz. Meanwhile, Boaz is sitting in the gate with the men, arguing and debating and finally agreeing on bargain prices. Ruth and Boaz become married. On their honeymoon, they conceive a baby. They settle down, and in due time, the baby is born. Naomi takes this young newborn into her arms, and the women stand around her and bless her, and everybody lives happily ever after. What a great story. I wanna share with you five insights revealing the beauty and planning of the Book of Ruth. Insight number one, Ruth is a well-crafted story 
with Naomi at the center. Now there is more to the story than meets the eye. First, it is probably the most well-crafted story I've ever read. From a literary point of view, it is well developed. The entire story, the book of Ruth, is about three and a half pages, double space, 1,260 words in Hebrew. Most of us can speak more words than that in three or four minutes. Think about this. The story is balanced. 71 words in the introduction, the first five verses. Then chapter four, the conclusion, 71 words. Not the epilogue, but the conclusion. In between it, it is not difficult to see these plays act out in four acts. Each of these dramatic acts has around 250 words, and each of these dramatic acts has two scenes. One of these scenes is in a public place, and the other is in a private place. And from the first half to the second half, they flip. So in the first half, you have the public scene first and then the private scene. And in the second half, you get another public scene and a private scene. I'm oh, sorry, that was all in the first scene. Let me do that over. So in the first half, you have a public scene first, then a private scene, then another public scene, private scene. Public, private, public, private. Then in the second half, private scene, public scene, private scene, public scene. Mirror image. Stories well crafted. The story is not just well crafted in terms of the way it's written, it's also well crafted in terms of characterization. There are pairings all the way through it. Ruth. She stands out. The book is named after her. She's paired up with Boaz. Ruth is young, single, widow. She is an alien in Israel. She is poor. And then there is Boaz, the counterpart. He is single, older, a firm part of the Israelite community. He is wealthy. The two of them meet cute and get together. I assume they meet cute. The Bible doesn't really define the emotions of it very well. But if you read between the lines, meet cute. Another pairing stands. Oops, I think I slipped a slide. Another pairing stands behind them as a support cast. The first one we read about is Orpah. Orpah is like Ruth, except she's not Ruth. Orpah has the same options and opportunities, but she does not take them in the same ways. At the end of the story, there is another guy. He is recognized as what's known as a kinsman redeemer, or the nearer relative. He is the guy who is like Boaz, but not like Boaz. He has the same opportunities as Boaz, but does not take them in the same direction. When we put this all together, what do we have? Ruth and Boaz, front and center, and then Orpah and the kinsman redeemer, standing somewhat back behind them. And then we have a third set of pairs. We have the women who surround Naomi. Naomi returns home and there they are. All these women come out of the fields and out of the homes. They gather around Naomi. They talk with her, resonate with her, and they show up again when she has a baby, even in her old age. They come around and say, oh, you are blessed. Their counterpart is a group of men that befriend Boaz. When he goes to the field, all the men come with him. He converses with them, and near the end of the story, he is sitting in the gates, and there they are again, the men surround Boaz. That is the cast of characters nicely laid out and easily balanced. But there's a problem. One character in the book is not paired. One person does not have a counterpart. That's Naomi. Naomi stands alone by herself. The women are close to her, but they are in the background while she is center stage. Ruth is next to her, but Ruth is never her equal. There are many other people in the community, but no one is a counterpart to Naomi. This is critical. It's a final element in the story because it reveals the theological impact of the story. Naomi is alone. What God wants us to discover and comprehend in the book of Ruth is that the story is not about Ruth or Boaz or the women or the men. It is not about Orpah or the kinsman redeemer. The story is about Naomi. Naomi is the only character without a twin. She is not paired. She stands alone, which leads us to ask this question. Why does Naomi stand alone? Insight number two. Naomi is a mirror of Israel and of us. Several times throughout the Bible, God holds a person up and says, look at that person. And when you look at that person, what you are seeing is not so much that person, but a mirror. Have you ever watched a baby see himself or herself in a mirror for the first time? 
I remember holding each of our kids up into a mirror when they were little. Babies look everywhere, and then finally they see the mirror. Ryan saw himself, and Jamie saw herself. I think by the time Jason, by the time Jason was born, I just showed him a picture and said, that's you. Um, each time, each one of them, when they saw themselves in the mirror, or in the picture, they got this big grin on their face. They realized for the first time that it was him or her. Now, did you know that this happens also with animals? Elephants like to look at themselves in the mirror, and whales like to look at themselves in the mirror. I don't know who discovered that first. That's just weird, but it's interesting. Unfortunately, it's difficult for them to find the right size mirrors. Try to imagine someone carrying a mirror big enough for an elephant to see him or herself, or dragging one through the water so that a whale can get a close-up. The cool thing about it is that both animals have great memories, so they do not need to keep taking more pics. When you look in a mirror, you realize who you are in a whole new way. For example, Samson in the book of Judges. Judges 13, I'm going to read verses 3 and 5. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. That's about Samson, miraculously born and killer of thousands, who was also the guy who was always going after things he should not go after. It was a mirror, a picture of Israel. Israel was miraculously born. Remember Abraham and Sarah, how old they were when they had a baby, and Israel was unusually strong? They triumphed over the nations of the Middle East by their own power? No, because the Spirit of God was on them, and they became a witness to other peoples. That was what Samson was supposed to be, a judge or a witness to the other nations around him, including Philistines. Now, this is also the case for Naomi. When you see Naomi, you are supposed to look in a mirror and say, oh, that's us. The Israelites were supposed to do that. Where does the story begin? In the days of the judges. What were the days of the judges like? As you read the book of Judges, you see a spiral that goes down, down, down. By the time you get to the last story of the judges, things have grown very dark. And then comes the appendix, chapters 17 through 21. The lights go out completely, as bleak and black as can be. Why? Because God had taken his people to a world that had forgotten its maker, to a world that did not have a sense of religion, a world that was focused on nothing more than, how do I get by? How do I make it through the day? How do I keep the devils away from me? to a world that had lost its sense of who their creator was. God had planted Israel in the worst land in the world. Have you been to Israel? Um, to an apple orchard kid from paradise like me, Israel is a horror. I have not been there, but I have seen pictures and films and it is all hills and rocks. I was fortunate to grow up in paradise because it had everything. We had a great school system, we had everywhere you could think of to explore, Great fishing, great hunting, skiing about 15 miles north of where I lived. Couldn't afford to ski, but it was there. It was a town where I could leave a little after sunup and come back home sometime after sundown, and my parents didn't worry about me at all. Now, my dad teased me when I complained about things. He would say, you wake up in, uh, every day in paradise, kid. It doesn't get much better than that. But in the Old Testament, God was the owner of all the real estate in the world. So what does he do? He tells his people to settle in the promised land of Palestine. That's crazy. That's the worst place of all, except for one thing. The promised land of Palestine happens to be the hinge of the world, the bridge of the world, the stage of the world, the one place in the entire world where all the civilizations of that day, for the sake of their industries, had to pass through. And when they passed through, they would see what was going on. God planted his community there, and he said, if you do it right, everybody is going to see it, and they will say, what is it that you have that we do not? What is going on with you? We would like it too. That was the purpose of planting Israel in Palestine. Then, in the time of the judges, the nation began slowly, and then with increasing velocity, to disintegrate. Why? Because they were forgetting about God. They were forgetting about the covenant. They were looking for ways to fit in, to be like everybody else and lose their religion and their witness. It is in that context that we view the book of Ruth. 
Insight number three, Naomi mirrors Israel's wandering from God's path. Now when the book of Ruth begins, a man, Elimelech, acts in a way that says, this is the land God has provided for us, but I prefer to go somewhere else where the land of opportunity is better. Elimelech, accompanied by his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, leaves the land of promise, the land of inheritance, to look for his fortune someplace else. If you're familiar with the book of Ruth, then you know that the book ends with a genealogical epilogue listing all the descendants from Perez to King David. It starts in the time of the judges and ends in the time of the kings. It starts in the time of destitution and ends in the Camelot setting of David's reign as king. David and his successor Solomon extend and expand the kingdom so far that all the nations of the Middle East fall under its shadow and blessing. The clues along the way are even more than that. Elimelech, his name means Yahweh is king. He moves to Moab, which results in a proverbial out of the frying pan into the fire situation. Balak, king of Moab, is stressed out when he realizes that a horde of Israelites may overpower them. So Balak sends messengers to find a prophet, Balaam, so that he can put a curse on the Israelites. Balaam is interested, but only if the price is right. The king provides the funds and Balaam goes out into the night to meet the God of Israel. God appears to Balaam, and he asks God to put a curse on them so that he could fight them and drive them away. Numbers 22, verses 12 and 13. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Now this part of the story continues for a while, leading to Balaam's donkey whom the Lord uses to talk to the prophet and give him a dose of common sense. Now, repeatedly, the king pushes the prophet to pronounce curses on Israel, but the prophet remains true to the word of the Lord. And in the closing verse of chapter 24, we read, Then Balaam got up and returned home, and Balak the king went his own way. Now, if you want to read a humorous portion of scripture, those chapters, these chapters and numbers will make you smile. There is an interesting twist toward the end of the story. The king insists on cursing Israel with a famine so he can take away his enemy's possessions. What happens? The curses. The king's sons, Malon and Kilian, get sick and die. It's interesting that those are not the names they were given at birth. Those are their nicknames. Why? Malon means weakly. Kilian means sickly. Nobody, especially not a king, would name their sons weakling and sickly. Can you imagine the king at a regal ceremony announcing, here are our two boys, weakly and sickly. Unfortunately, that, not, that would not have happened if the king had not insisted on cursing Israel. There is much to be known about the names of characters in scripture. What does Naomi's name mean? No doubt her parents gave her the name I mentioned before, Sweetie Pie. That's an interesting name, Sweetie Pie. It's kind of more in our vernacular. but Maybe Elimelech called her that the first time they had a date. You are my Sweetie Pie. But when Naomi returns home to Bethlehem, she says, call me Mara, which means bitter. The sweetie pie has become bitter. What about Bethlehem itself? Bethlehem means house of bread. Is there bread in the house of Israel? No, there is not at that time. There is famine, and it will continue through to the end of the story when the harvest comes in again. That is when the crops succeed and the bread is restored to the shelves. So how does it happen? Ruth. Ruth's name means friend companion. Boaz means in him is strength. These are the people who restored Israel. Friend and strength. That is a good combination. Insight number four. Naomi mirrors how Israel can return to God's blessing. Now as you read the story, questions arise. How will Israel, who sits there in destitution, become Israel once again? How will Israel ever become the blessed light of God to the nations? How will that happen? Well, keep your eye on Naomi. You will find it in the name of her child. Ruth 4.13, and she gave birth to a son. Verse 17, the women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The name Obed means serving or worshiping. In other words, servant. The narrative of the book of Ruth is essentially a rags to riches story. The characters show us how we can go from destitution to restoration. The answer is always the same. 
How do you go from the time of famine to the time of bounty? How do you go from the time of the judges to the time of the Camelot kings? How do you go from a lowly nobody to the person you were born to be? One word, service. You do it by doing what you were born to do. Do you know who you are? Here is the mirror. Now, I was supposed to hold up a hand mirror, but I forgot. So pretend like you're seeing yourself. So what do you see when you look in the mirror? When I look in the mirror, I see Orpah. I see the kinsman redeemer. They were the wise people. They were doing what was appropriate. They were doing what seemed best. Orpah said, yes, you are right, Naomi. You are never going to have another baby. We need to move on with our lives. Sorry, it has been a good ride, but now it's time for me to look after myself again. So the kinsman redeemer does not want to marry Ruth because he is already married. And the law says if your brother dies and there are no children from the marriage, the land is passed along from male to male to male. And for that family to continue to have a place in the community, there has to be another male. So how will that happen? Well, it turns out you can have multiple marriages. But this man must marry Ruth and have a son, and that son would get the land. Which means that he must buy this land, and then he would lose it and his other sons by his other wife who would not inherit the property. He says, you're asking too much of me. He's free to say no, and those in the gates say that's okay. But Boaz goes beyond the, beyond the call of duty, and Ruth goes beyond the call of duty. They do this not because they have something to gain by it, but because somebody else in a situation of distress has no one to count on. The story of Ruth is all about Naomi looking at her in the mirror. Insight number five. We return to God's blessings when we embrace our identity as servants of God. How is Ruth going to get from there to here? It happens when people keep promises to God. It happens when people remember who they are. It happens when people do the right thing, even though the right thing may cost them personal pleasure and security. It happens when the community of faith lives as if it is a community of faith. It happens when you make choices to be with people who are not necessarily going to make your life any better because of it. It happens when you stay with a marriage that is coming undone, when it means that the other person at least will have a contact with blessing. It means you stick it out with kids who are turning their backs on you. It means you stay in a society with friends and others whose lifestyles you don't approve. If they do not have you, what life is about, and to remind them of where God is. I'm going to wrap up the end of this message with a little story and then a, a little bit of something after that. Um, this anecdote is featuring a man named Fred Craddock, who was a teacher of preaching. Uh, he was on an airline flying to Texas. Now, the guy next to him was obviously wealthy, had expensive clothes, nice rings, yeah, plural, and a ridiculously show off gold necklace with diamonds. So the guy strikes up a conversation. Fred did not want a conversation. The guy says to him, what do you do? He says, I'm a preacher. Oh, says the guy. Well, that's great. I'm preparing my Sunday school lesson for this Sunday. Maybe you can help me. Just what a preacher wants to hear. So he takes out this big yellow pad, and then he says, who are you going to vote for in the next election? And Fred says, oh, I don't know. I'm still weighing the options. Man says, well, I'm going to vote for so-and-so because so-and-so is for oil, and I'm from Texas, and Texas is for oil. I'm for him because he's for oil. Now, Fred does not know what to do, so he lapses into silence for a while, and the guy continues to work on his Sunday school lesson. As the plane is coming down to Texas, the guy looks over and says, I'm sorry. Fred says, why? He says, I'm sorry I said I'm for oil. I, I'm not really for oil. I, I had to be reminded again in the story for this week that I am for Jesus. And Jesus is for me. Excuse me. It may be that I vote for this person, and it may be that I vote for that person, but I am not for oil. Because I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I am for Jesus, and I need to ask, who would Jesus want me to vote for, and what does Jesus want for this community, and where are we going, and why are we going there? Now, Fred said nothing to direct this man to vote against oil. Sometimes, saying nothing is the best you can say. One final example. Richard Palmetto, a four-year-old boy, was standing in the checkout line at a supermarket. Now, his dad had been killed in an accident when he was a toddler. His mother was mentally challenged. She'd been in and out of psychiatric hospitals all her life, and after losing three babies, gave Richard up for adoption. 
Now, Richard lived most of his first years in an orphanage, and then his grandmother showed up. She was on welfare and had said she could not handle him, but then she decided, he's flesh and blood of mine, I must take him in. One day, they went to the grocery store. While they were shopping, they walked down the cereal aisle. His grandmother always chose the brand of cereal that did not taste good, because that's the kind you buy with food stamps. But there's Tony the Tiger, and Tony the Tiger tastes great. Richard wanted Tony the Tiger, and he started needling and wheedling with his grandmother until finally she gave in and put it in the cart. They came to the checkout and put it on the belt, and she started doling out her food stamps. And the guy behind said, look at that. I'm paying for my own groceries, and I can't afford to give my kids that kind of cereal. And here she is on food stamps, and I'm paying her bill and mine. And look what she's buying. She's buying a sweet cereal. He has no business having that. She has no right to do that. It's my money. How is this family going to pay us back? And Richard Palmetto said that he had never forgotten, excuse me, debating whether he gets a drink or not, never forgotten what his grandmother did. She placed her hands on my shoulders. She turned to face him head on with me in between and she said to him, I will never be able to pay you back. But he, he will pay back society every last cent. You can count on it, for I have made it my life's work to make sure he survives and thrives. That's a good grandmother. So let me wrap this up. Did you see yourself this morning in this message? Who are you? When, who were you when you woke up this morning? Now, who do you think you are? Do you know? Have you looked in the mirror? Can others count on you for the right reasons? Can God count on you? I know you. PV and I pray for you. We know that in this life you will do what it takes to build the kingdom of God, and for that we are ever at your service and forever grateful. So, happy Mother's Day, and don't forget, um, if you're interested, there's a Disney family sing-along with a lot of the best movie songs on ABC tonight. You may not like Disney, but it's fun singing the songs. Your mom just may want to sing along. So let me uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message that you inspired for me for Mother's Day. Uh, I really enjoyed working with it, and I hope that my listeners uh, enjoy it as well. I also pray that uh, mother, all the mothers for, for today will be blessed and uh, strengthened and encouraged by their families and because mothers just do so much for us. And for that, we are grateful to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen to you.